and it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you kindly, Speaker. Speaker, my uh, questions to the, the Premier. Parents and students are bracing themselves for a, a day of job action that will close hundreds of schools across the province on Wednesday. The four governments plowing ahead with classroom cuts uh, that mean larger classes and forcing students into mandatory online learning courses. The four government insists that they're on the side of parents. They point to the millions of parents they heard from in consultations. Uh, can they tell us how many parents approved of their plans for larger classes uh, in those consultations? I recognize the Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker. The government is absolutely focused on getting a voluntary agreement with our educator unions because we want to keep kids in class. Mr. Speaker, what we have done is listen to those we have served. And by doing so, we've announced just weeks ago that we will move the, the uh, classroom size provincial average for secondary students from 28 to 25. We have listened to parents when we made a move to uh, move the uh, number of online courses from four to two. We made a move when we more than doubled the mental health funding envelope to ensure the support for those in need. Mr. Speaker, we have demonstrated we're listening to those that we serve. What we also have seen, notwithstanding the moves the government has made, is a continuation by teacher unions to escalate irrespective of the good faith bargaining and the moves we have made. That is regrettable. We believe strikes hurt kids, and the question for Response. members of is do you stand with parents against escalation by teacher unions? The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, according to a report from Global News yesterday, the government's consultation with parents had some pretty conclusive results. Yes. Approximately 70 per cent of parents felt an increase in class sizes would negatively impact students' learning, and that means an, a, an increase from 22 to 28, not to 25, like the minister said in his response. Uh, a majority of parents oppose the mandatory e-learning for students, again, not four classes down to two, but zero up to two. They still oppose it, Speaker. Why is the Ford government picking a fight with teachers to implement cuts that parents clearly, clearly told them that they don't want? Questions been referred to the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, 100 per cent of parents want kids to be in class on Wednesday, and our government agrees with them. Speaker, the parents of this province want all parties to be reasonable. That is why we tabled a move from the provincial average from 20 to 25. It's why in online courses we moved from four to two. It's why we increased support for STEM and math max the class and doubled the mental health portfolio. Mr. Speaker, for 203 consecutive days, the teachers' unions have not made a single substantive change. They have been absolutely dogmatic, and the and the, and the continuation of here is with respect to their, fact, their, their emphasis on getting a one point $5 billion increase in salary. That seems to be the fundamental issue at the table, Mr. Speaker. We will continue to work in good faith to get deals because parents of, province, parents of this province deserve predictability and children should be in class on Wednesday and every day thereafter. Bond. The final supplementary. Speaker, the fundamental issue is that parents and educators and educational workers in this province are Order. fighting to save our public education system. And the Let's be clear. The government held a formal consultation with thousands of parents. Parents clearly in, and unequivocally rejected larger class sizes, fewer courses, and mandatory online learning. The Ford government not only plowed ahead with those cuts, but they hid the results from that very consultation speaker and claimed that parents actually supported the cuts that they had clearly already rejected. And now the Ford government's ready to close every school in the province to keep those cuts in place. Yep. Will the government release the full Order. results of this consultation today, or better yet, reverse Question. the classroom cuts? Minister to reply. Mr. Speaker, the government's aim is to be reasonable and to get deals, as we did with QP just a month ago. But, Mr. Speaker, for 203 consecutive days, the teacher unions have not made any substantive change. The onus is on all parties to be reasonable. The government has listened to those we serve. We've listened to parents and students. We made significant changes to our bargaining position. What has not transpired is any change at all by the teachers unions, and that is regrettable. We are in this position because they are escalating, irrespective of the premier who is in the chair. You could be a new Democrat. 
Democrat, a Liberal, and a Progressive Conservative, what unites them is escalation by teachers. We oppose, and I ask members off to stand with parents, oppose this against this escalation. The next question. Again, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker, my next question is also to the Premier, but let's be clear, we're in this position because this government picked a fight with education workers yeah. in this province. Yeah. But this question, Speaker, is about the government's priorities as Canada's Premiers or meet order. in Mississauga today. While families in Ontario were worried about hallway medicine and the high costs of drugs, Ontario's Premier says that, uh, uh, says that he's opposed to efforts to create a national pharmacare plan. Instead, he wants flexibility on how health care dollars from Ottawa can be spent. Hmm. Presumably, that means the freedom not to spend them on health care. <laughs> Will the Ontario uh, Premier be recruiting other provincial leaders to oppose a plan that would make prescription drugs more affordable for the people of this great province? The Deputy Premier. Well, I can assure the uh, Leader of the Official Opposition that the health and safety of Ontario patients and making sure that prescriptions are affordable is of utmost priority to us. We have heard various things from the federal government. We're not exactly sure what they're going to come forward with since the election, since the report that was written by Dr. Hoskins, which is very broad and all-encompassing, or whether it's something more narrow than that. I have had one conversation with the new Federal Minister of Health. I've indicated to her that the priorities for us right now are making sure that we can afford and deal with the orphan and rare disease drugs that are increasing our health costs by dramatic levels each and every year. I think there's a lot that we can focus on. I look forward to the first meeting with the provincial territorial leaders in health care with the new federal minister to discuss this. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the best way to make uh, drugs universally affordable to all Ontarians is through a universal pharmacare plan. I would, I would ask the minister to take that into consideration. Look, the Premier has also made a name for himself across the country, leading the war on the environment, fighting any effort to put a price on pollution or address the climate crisis. So, will Ontario's Premier be recruiting other provincial leaders to join? his lawsuit against the federal government's climate plan? Deputy Premier. Minister of the Environment, the Environment Conservation and Parks. Thanks very much uh, from the member opposite. And, uh, we just uh, celebrated our one-year anniversary of our Made in Ontario Environment Plan, yeah. Mr. Speaker. And we've taken drastic steps over the last year to lay the groundwork to reach our, our emissions target of 30 percent below uh, 2005 levels by 2030, Mr. Speaker. Uh, right now, I, today and later on, I'll be meeting with the Federal Minister of the Environment, and we're going to have that discussion about our, in, our performance standards uh, that we've, uh, we've uh, put forward towards the ministry. And that will allow us to ensure that the heavy polluters of this province are, 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 are paying their fair share with regards to their pollution, but also working with them to lower their emissions so that we can start tackling the emissions within our province, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite, the leader opposite, has no plan on the environment, Mr. Speaker. All they talk about is tax it. They have zero plans for the environment. I'm looking forward for them to join in the conversation, give us some ideas, other than a carbon tax that's going to do nothing but cripple low- and medium-income people throughout this province, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I dare say that was probably a pretty sad celebration. Uh, look, as Ontario parents are wondering whether schools will stay open all week, the Premier has been making a play for the national stage. But instead of putting forward a vision that would actually help Ontario families who are struggling with the cost of drugs or put Ontario at the front of the clean energy economy, the Ford government's vision for Canada is a country with no pharmacare and no plan for climate change. Right. Does this Ontario Premier really think this is the leadership that Ontario families deserve? Minister of the Environment. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I can take further our announcement uh, just last week of uh, creating our, our climate ch change advisory panel, Mr. Speaker, which we've taken uh, experts from across this field. Mr. Speaker, not only are we dealing on the environment with regards to reducing our emissions, we're also taking care of our land, air, and water, Mr. Speaker. We're ensuring that we start dealing with plastics. Right now, we just started a consultation with municipalities, indigenous communities, and the people of this province in order to change our recycling programs so we remove plastics out of the program, out of our, our of our landfills, move plastics out of our environment, and create a new circular economy, Mr. Speaker. That's 
going to recycle those plastics and create better economy for the province, Mr. Speaker. Our, uh, we in, in announced our uh, impact uh, and assessment uh, analysis throughout the province, so we know what key areas that we can plan for down the road, so municipalities and Indigenous communities can actually focus on what climate change is going to be doing to the Response? region, so they can make smart investments, Mr. Speaker. That does include new technology, but also includes innovative ways that individual people in this province can move forward to clean up our environment. And I'm proud of our plan going forward, Mr. Speaker, as is the government of this province. The next question is the opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Last week, this legislature unanimously passed a motion opposing Quebec's Bill 21 and calling on the Government of Ontario to formally request that Quebec repeal the law. The support for that motion was welcomed by groups like the World Sick Organization, the Toronto Board of Rabbis, and the National Council of Canadian Muslims. However, immediately after confirming their support for the motion, the Ford government made it clear they would not be raising these serious concerns about human rights with the Government of Canada. Quebec. Can the Ford government confirm that they have not formally communicated the views of this legislature to the government of Quebec? The Deputy Premier. To the government House Leader. Government House Leader. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as I've said uh, last week on a number of uh, occasions, uh, the Premier was very, uh, very clear on this. A law like this would never have a place in the province of Ontario. And uh, as the, the leader of the opposition knows uh, full well, this, uh, this legislature was unanimous not once but twice uh, on, on Bill 21. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, unfortunately, I have not had any light shed on the question that I asked, Speaker. For people who had dared to hope that they'd see some action when this legislature unanimously passed this motion, the Ford government's refusal to stand up for basic rights and freedoms is a betrayal. Last week, we had the embarrassing sight of Ontario's Premier insisting he would not discuss human rights at a meeting with Quebec's Premier, only to learn that Quebec's Premier planned to raise the issue himself. Right. This legislature asked the Premier to stand up for human rights. Why didn't he? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, this party has always stood up for human rights, uh, uh, and so has this Premier. Sure. This Premier was very quickly to, to suggest that uh, a bill like this would have no place in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This yeah. caucus and this legislature did that on two occasions, but the member opposite continues to play politics on something that is very important to all members of this legislature. We talked about the members of this legislature who the, me the first uh, uh, turban-wearing Sikh to become a cabinet minister, Mr. Speaker. These are things that are important, but I say to the member opposite, if the member opposite is so, so uh, wanting to play politics on this, may I suggest that she call her former deputy leader, the current leader of the New Democratic Party in Ottawa, and see what his position is, and ask him to help on this, Mr. Speaker. On this side of the House, we'll continue to stand up for those people who need our help, Mr. Speaker. And uh, going forward, of course, we're going to continue to work on building a strong economy for all Ontarians. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Mm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In my riding in Mississauga Centre, as elsewhere in Ontario, people are working hard to uh, make a living. And they elected a government that wants to support them and different sectors in the economy of this province. That's why I was very happy to realize the, the, how the Ministry of Francophone Affairs took uh, their direction to exploit the, and use uh, the wealth of francophones in the province. That uh, goes with the uh, uh, project to support the francophone uh, university for and by francophones. It's a great moment to be a francophone and a francophone such as me. Does the Minister of Francophone Affairs can tell us about the round table, economic round table that she led last week in Toronto? Minister of Francophone Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her question. Whereas our government is working with the Francophone community to promote the interests and defend the rights and what was gained by Franco Ontarians, we have also as a mission to have Ontario be open to job to uh, business and to create jobs. Last week, Gila Marteau, my a parliamentary assistant uh, with others. We had a round table that was very positive, uh, very promising uh, in terms of pro uh, investing in Toronto. It was the occasion to take contact and exchange ideas, to network with, Francophone, uh, with Toronto Francophone business leaders. 
as well as other institutions, so as to develop that potential for all Ontarians with measurements of economic development to uh, to um, have uh, the same interests. I thank the Minister for uh, answer for hard work with the Francophone community in Ontario. In fact, if uh, the University of uh, Franco-Ontario is a very big uh, lever for development for the Francophones in the province, our government uh, tries in all kinds of ways to do good for people by making their life easier. And we do that not uh, to by leading uh, the province with our eyes closed like the Liberals did, with a lot of debt for new generations. Does the, can the minister tell us further what the meeting she had with leaders, business leaders, uh, francophone business leaders last week, and the exchanges that took place uh, and will take place in our province? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As Minister of Francophone Affairs, I want also the, the Franco-Ontario community develop to its maximum and be in a strength economy and with economic renewal as it can be for the good of Ontario. What we talked about during the round tables, it's a, a sort of an, a patriotic economism, uh, economic patriotism, to develop sectors where francophones are already present or where they could be, to export products and services for francophone markets like Quebec and, uh, and abroad. We are here to make it easier, either by working together or by taking away their red tape or to use levers that exist, uh, well, to go farther, to create jobs and to prosper further uh, in both the province and francophones. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Education. After many, many months of trying to bury the truth about their plan to fire teachers and cut classes, it turns out that the and I ask the member to withdraw and rephrase your question. Uh, it turns out that the government's own consultation documents confirm what Ontarians have been saying all along. No one thinks that this government's plan to jack up class sizes is a good idea. They never asked for it. They don't want it, period. It's clear from the consultation that this government doesn't care what Ontario families think. Mr. Speaker, why does this government think they know better than the thousands of teachers, students, and families who just want the best for their kids? The questions to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the, to the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, all parties at the table must be reasonable, and this government has demonstrated a reasonable posture and a focus on keeping students in class. Mr. Speaker, it is the impetus for why we made a move to go from a 28 provincialized average to 25. It's why we went from four online learning courses to two. Mr. Speaker, it's why we're preserving the lowest classroom size in the nation for our young, for early years. Mr. Speaker, we're doing this by investing in public education. What we expect is for all parties to be reasonable. For two 203 consecutive days, the unions have made no change at all to their position, not a single substantive move, and I think that is unacceptable. I think strikes hurt kids. And the question for the member opposite is, do you agree? Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, when you cut your cuts in half, that doesn't make an improvement. Class sizes, class sizes aren't up for negotiation. Parents don't want it. Students Porter. don't want it. You're using students as pawns in your negotiations while this government continues to escalate stop the clock okay the member for davenport has the floor she's close to me i should be able to hear her i need to be able to hear her i would ask the house to come to order start the clock member for davenport Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I guess I'm getting under their skin. Uh, while this government continues to escalate their attacks on teachers and the education system, the minister has tried to tell us that his terrible plan for class size hikes was just part of some negotiation strategy. Look at where we find ourselves. But everyone knows that when your starting point is firing 10,000 teachers and cancelling tens of thousands of classes, it's not a negotiation, it's a hostage situation. Question. 
question. Speaker, no amount of spin is going to get them out of this. Why won't this minister come clean with Ontarians, admit that their plan to force teachers out of their jobs, force students into crammed huts? Thank you. Was completely Thank you. Forced. Minister, to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our government is absolutely laser focused on getting deals with all tables because we want to keep the children of this province in class. That is why, Mr. Speaker, our government made a decision to move the Order. provincial average from 28 to 25. It's why we cut the online course number from four to two. We brought that down. It's why we doubled our investment in mental health. It's why we increased expenditure to the highest levels ever recorded in public education. What every member Order. of this legislature should agree with is the premise that all the parties have to be reasonable. Only one has been in this government. The unions have opted. The unions have opted for 203 Order. consecutive days to not make any significant or substantive change to their position. That is unacceptable for families. They want all the parties to be reasonable because we need to work together to keep the children of this province in class. Yeah. Can our government to continue to be student-centric and fight to ensure kids stay in class every day? The next question. The member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, across Ontario today. The member for Don Valley West. I apologize. I, I, I'm not able to recognize you at this time. The next question, the member for Scarborough Centre. Mr. Speaker. Go ahead and keep the Minister of Education question train going. Mr. Speaker, as a mother and as an educator, I know how devastating bullying can be on a child. We know that the longer a child is bullied, the more likely they are to develop physical, emotional, and psychological scars that can last a lifetime. In several tragic cases, Mr. Speaker, constant harassment and bullying has prompted students to take their own lives. This is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. We urgently need to learn from these incidents and take action to protect the children of Ontario. Could the Minister of Education please tell the House about some of the steps our government is taking to combat bullying in our schools? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Allow me to thank the member from Scarborough Centre for her leadership in combating bullying on behalf of all parents and students in this province. I was excited to stand with her, the member from Thornhill, as well as the Minister of Children and uh, Services, as we work together to combat the scourge of bullying that is so clearly growing within our schools in every region of Ontario. We announced a five-point plan is the first step in our commitment to combat the growing escalation of bullying in our schools. In the health and physical education curriculum, Mr. Speaker, we put a major focus on removing the visible and invisible differences that could manifest in class. That starts with respect to help young people, be it in the context of body shaming, LGBT community, uh, children, as well as so many others who face a significant level of bullying to know with confidence they should see themselves in their curriculum. Mr. Speaker, we put a nearly $250,000 investment to help Response. combat bullying in the context of de-escalation training and will continue to support the safety of every child in this province. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, as a former teacher with the Toronto District School Board, I was honoured when the minister recently asked me to advise him and the government on educational matters with a special emphasis on bullying prevention. As a former educator, I have seen the negative effects that bullying can have firsthand. Bullying is an age-old and global problem that requires a multifaceted approach, involving the collective work of children, parents, and educators. Really, that requires the work of anyone that cares about our children here in Ontario. First and foremost, though, Mr. Speaker, we need information. Information so that we know what is happening and can act decisively and accordingly. So I ask the minister, what is the government doing to reach out to our students in order to learn more about the scourge of bullying? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite. Mr. Speaker, indeed, we want to ensure students have a voice, and that's why we announced a province-wide survey to empower them to share their voice, their narrative, and to help the government better understand the pervasive nature of this issue. It's why, Mr. Speaker, when we held a roundtable with a member from Scarborough Centre with students to hear frontline what they want more of, of our government, we heard an eye-opening discussion where they wanted more online uh, they wanted a survey. They wanted a better review of our reporting set practices, our enforcement. They wanted more support for educators and de-escalation training. Mr. Speaker, all of these initiatives are all part of our plan to support our kids, ensure every single child in this province, irrespective of heritage, of faith, orientation, age, place of birth, or color of skin, can see themselves with confidence reflected in our schools. 
The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. As nauseating as it was to hear that exchange on bullying from a government bull currently bullying education workers. Okay. And ask the member to rephrase his introduction to his question. This is the Deputy Premier. On Saturday, our office in Ottawa Centre hosted a town hall to discuss public transit. Over 100 people turned out to share their ideas, speakers, and frustration with the state of Ottawa's transit system and our light rail transit system in particular. Since its launch in September, the LRT repeatedly ground to a halt due to mechanical failures, leaving thousands of people stranded. To make matters worse, Speaker, we've heard from riders living downtown whose commutes have lengthened because route changes and reductions in buses have accompanied the LRT launch. Speaker, as the MPP for Ottawa Centre, I was excited by the launch of the LRT, but its first two and a half months has been nothing short of a debacle. More than two weeks ago, this government pledged that help was on the way, but since then we've heard nothing. Premier, what can we count on from actual support from your government beyond words? Deputy Premier. Minister of Transportation. Referred to the Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we have been following very closely the situation in Ottawa with respect to the LRT, and uh, we've been speaking closely with our colleagues in our, in our caucus uh, who represent the Ottawa area. Obviously, there are a lot of difficulties in operating uh, the, the LRT. Uh, the Ministry of Transportation reached out to, uh, to Ottawa to see how we can support their efforts. It's a municipally run project. We want to be uh, respectful of their jurisdiction with respect to this project and at the same time offer the support and the technical uh, aid that, that is necessary. We're still discussing this with the, city, with, with, the, uh, with, uh, with the city of Ottawa, and we will have more to say once resolution has been reached. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. At our town hall in Ottawa Centre, we heard story after story about unreliable schedules, overcrowding, and delays. Riders are at their wits' end, and many are giving up, sadly, on public transit altogether. We heard one participant who told us how she has to walk extraordinary distances everywhere now. Others forced into winter cycling without a sense of what that requires. Another simply saying they were, they were, they were stranded, Speaker, from picking up their kids at the end of the day. These are real meaningful hardships, not, to, not even counting people with disabilities whose impacts are faced even harsher. Speaker, public confidence in this LRT cannot get much lower, but the public-private partnership model supported by the previous Liberal government and this government right over here is leading to secrecy and problems for people in our profession and politics getting Order. to the bottom of this problem. Question. The province has invested $1.2 billion to the second phase of LRT. We want to know in Ottawa how are you working to make sure bad mistakes aren't repeated? How are you making sure phase two is Minister of Transportation, your reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, as the member knows, this is a municipally run project, and the, pro the province has committed funding to phases one and two of the Ottawa LRT project, and we are very pleased to be able to support the transit needs in the city of Ottawa in this way. But the province, while it is committed funding, respects the jurisdiction of the municipality to operate the LRT. That said, we have reached out and officials are working closely with the City of Ottawa to see how we can help them resolve the issues because we don't want to see transit riders in the City of Toronto, in the City of Ottawa stranded. We're continuing to work with them, and when we have been able to come to some agreement with the City of Ottawa on this, we will have more to say. In the meantime, we are supporting their efforts. It is a municipally run project. The next question, the member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Ministers, this summer it was my pleasure to have you join my colleagues and I in Waterloo Region to announce Ontario's investments in transit infrastructure. And I want to also acknowledge that Premier Ford visited to further support our government's investment in transit for the region. Our government is investing more than $61 million to support transit and road projects that will see improved service for the people living in Waterloo Region. All three levels of government must work together to ensure these important infrastructure investments are made across the province, and I believe the federal government has already indicated support for these important projects. Can the minister advise if there are any other transit projects that Waterloo, regions, uh, that Waterloo Region can look forward to in the near future? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Kitchener 
Conestoga for his question, his representation for his riding and his region. Ontario is investing more than $61 million for transit infrastructure that will improve services to the residents of Kitchener and Waterloo area. In addition to the transit operations facility, Ontario is investing more than $9 million, which will be used to add or replace conventional and specialized vehicles in the fleet. Our investments also include funding for the building of cycling and pedestrian bridges and trails that will lead to better integration of transit services. Our government is and will continue to work with our municipal partners, families and businesses to make smart investments in our infrastructure and keep it reliable for the people of Ontario. These projects were brought forward as priority projects for our municipal partners and are supported by the Response. region of Waterloo, Mr. Speaker, and there'll be more to come. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for your continued support for these infrastructure projects that are so important to the people of Kitchener, Conestoga, and Waterloo Region. Minister, in addition to these uh, transit projects, our government is providing funding for road and bridge infrastructure. I know some of those investments include more than $469,000 in rehabilitation of the Glasgow Street North Bridge in Woolwich and more than $1.1 million for the replacement of a bridge over the Nith River in Wilmot Township. These road and bridge projects, together with the transit infrastructure projects, will benefit families, students and businesses throughout the area. Minister, I know some of the region's projects have received final federal approval, while others are still waiting. Is the minister able to provide an update on these remaining projects? Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member is quite right again. Eight of the 17 projects the province nominated through the ICIP funding agreement have in fact received final approval and can now proceed. While there are nine pending approval, I remain optimistic that the new federal government in Ottawa will move quickly to approve these projects, thus allowing the municipality to move forward. It's worth noting that a number of these projects brought forward by municipal officials will directly benefit university and college students in Kitchener-Waterloo. Over $1.2 million of provincial money will be put toward the building of a shel shelter canopy in the University of Waterloo, and over $2.8 million for the expansion of transit service at Conestoga College. Mr. Speaker, once completed, these projects will reduce congestion, improve commutes, connect neighbourhoods Spons. and businesses, and people yeah. to their jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. The member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker Jean Hamlin Daycare Centre in Dufferin County is facing closure with 65 daycare spots at risk. A report at Dufferin County Council states that, that the child care centre is already running at a deficit and recommends shutting the centre down entirely as a result of further funding cuts by this government. Speaker Jean Hamlin, da Hamlin Daycare Centre already has a wait list for new kids. So my question is, with a shortage of quality, affordable child care spaces in Ontario, why is this government cutting funding for child care and forcing centres to close? Deputy Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. On the contrary, the government is investing over $2 billion to build tens of thousands of childcare spaces in every region of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, in addition to a $2 billion allocation to build 30,000 new childcare spaces, 10,000 new schools, 20,000 existing schools, we also, to the, being the only political party in this legislature that believes in parental choice for childcare, the member opposite does not support, or her leader does not support, as do the Liberals. They support a one-child-fits-all approach. We do not. We believe parents are the best decision-makers about their children's child care. That's why we introduced the child care tax credit to provide over $1,000 on average per child under 18 for a middle-income family in this province. We're providing investment, we're expanding choice, we're building new spaces, and we're making child care affordable after the highest child care cost after 15 years Response. of the Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Speaker, sounds to me like this government is irresponsibly spending people's hard-earned dollars, and yet people of this province are struggling. These parents have been told to look for daycare options elsewhere in Dufferin County. For families in Orangeville, that means finding new private daycare spots some 25 kilometers away in Shelburne or Grand Valley. Speaker, high quality, affordable childcare should be available for parents in every community in Ontario. 
Will this government stop their reckless cuts and clearly irresponsible spending so that parents in Orangeville and across the province don't lose any more daycare in their communities? Thank Order. you. Sir. Response, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite will know that our government is investing over $2 billion to build over 30,000 new childcare spaces to provide more choice for families in this province. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the, the specific example cited is a decision exclusively made by the municipality. However, the Solicitor General of this province is proud just weeks ago to announce in the French board, in her riding, new childcare spaces for families in her community. We're doing that because we believe in choice, we believe in both institutional daycare and providing a, a child care benefit for every middle-class family who's eligible, up to 75 percent of expenses, putting over $1,000 per child in the pockets of working families. Mr. Speaker, this is the approach of our government, more choice, more options, and more monies in their pockets. The next question, the member for Richmond Hill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Minister, you rose in the House last Monday to speak about the great success our government found last week. Thank you for your success in India. My businesses in riding of Richmond Hill are very excited. You have already secured investment deal with WDN Technologies for the people of Kitchener-Waterloo, a deal that will bring over 200 new skilled, high-paying jobs for workers and families. Can the minister tell this House what further agreements were signed while you were leading your business mission in India? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you to the member from Richmond Hill for the question. Uh, speaker, during the mission, Seneca College was also able to sign three MOUs that will promote the exchange of information and expertise. Ontario's academic institutions offer cutting-edge training, skills development and services that are in global demand. 52,000 uh, students from India are in Ontario. Ontario's business delegation had 150 business-to-business -business meetings with Indian businesses to explore opportunities for future partnerships, including India's infrastructure needs. This will give Ontario businesses a competitive advantage in accessing contracts for the $1.5 trillion in infrastructure projects India is building over the next five years. India stands to benefit from Ontario's internationally Response. recognized construction technology and design, and our mission was key in building and strengthening those relationships. The supplementary. Thank you, Minister. It is great to know our government is doing its part to help Ontario workers' businesses get access to some of the world's fastest growing and most lucrative markets. Minister, we know as part of your business mission, you met with international leaders in the infrastructure sector and managed to secure deals which will benefit the people of Ontario who work in that space. Well, India also has one of the largest information technology sectors in the world. Can the minister explain what progress was made having the people of Ontario re increase access to this exciting market in India? Mr. Speaker, during the mission, we met with representatives from the state of Karnataka, home to Bangalore, India's leader in IT, to advance a formal partnership. This partnership will provide Ontario with a competitive advantage to access this market and develop opportunities for increased trade, investment and partnerships. India's information and technology sector is set to reach $350 US billion US dollars by 2025, making it the largest sourcing destination for IT. Now, Ontario is an ideal jurisdiction for partnership with India. We are North America's second largest IT cluster. So we will continue to take a proactive lead when it comes to international trade and bring our message everywhere. Speaker, we are cutting Response. red tape and instead rolling out the red carpet. This tells people we're open for business and open for trade. The next question, the member for Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. The Auditor General is preparing her first report on this government's so called climate policy. The forthcoming report is expected to call into question Ontario's ability to meet its Paris Accord targets. Diane Sachs, the former Environmental Commissioner, 
the one this government gave a pink slip to, has said that there is, quote, no credible evidence behind the Conservative government's emission reduction forecasts. In advance of the report, coming Wednesday, is the government willing to state in the Legislature today that they are on track to meet their forecast for reducing greenhouse gas emissions? The question is uh, addressed to Deputy Premier. To the Minister of the Environment. The Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I, I look forward to the release of the Auditor General's report on Wednesday. Um, you know, I, I guess there's uh, plenty of information being spread out there, but we'll know Wednesday uh, what the report is entailing in its whole. But the one thing we have uh, we've come to see over the last year, Mr. Speaker, is that not one single plan or idea is a one-size-fits-all for any province, region, or, or community, Mr. Speaker. And our living document, the Environment Plan, will continue to evolve over the years and change over time as new technologies become on board. And we're going to maintain our, our work towards reducing our, tar uh, reducing our emissions to our 30 percent target, and hopefully we're going to go beyond that target by 2030, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to partner with private business to look at their innovation, because we know we're going to have to partner with them. We're going to partner with other levels of government, municipal and federal, to ensure we're working together on a common goal to reducing Response. our emissions, Mr. Speaker. We've done a lot of things this year that are going to pay benefits down the road. For instance, uh, the Waite Power Corporation that we've made amendments towards so they can start building their transmission lines to remove seven diesel uh, communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. A supplementary question. Thanks, Speaker. So I guess they're not on track to meet their commitments. <laughs> so again to the Premier. To quote the former environmental it. commissioner, quote, the government's climate change plan doesn't add up. So far, this Conservative government spent at least $231 million to cancel green energy projects that were already underway. It tore electric vehicle charging stations out of the ground. Order. It cancelled the successful Green On Home Energy program, throwing homeowners and businesses into chaos. It wasted millions of taxpayer dollars to take the federal government to court. And it quoted climate denial blogs in this House. That's not a plan, Speaker. Ontarians deserve better. Right Will the government today commit to changing course, accepting the science, and coming up with a real climate change plan? Minister, uh, Minister of Energy. Referred to the Minister of Energy, Northern well, thank Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as, as you listen to that, it becomes abundantly clear that what NDP really stands for. This is the new denial party, Mr. Speaker. This is the party Order. that would deny the people of Hamilton and the workers at DeFasco an affordable supply of electricity that would not come from erratic wind turbines, Mr. Speaker. This is the kind of uh, party that would deny Timmins and the Borden mine a fully electric mine that was actually affordable. This is the kind of party that would deny Toronto and the GTA one of the largest green infrastructure projects in the history of this province, Mr. Speaker, Order. and vote against it. This is the party that would deny Durham and nuclear technology, Mr. Speaker, a green form of energy that not only supplies this province, employs 6,000 people, but also a dynamic profile of world-class isotopes, Mr. Speaker, and deny the fact that they voted for a 65 percent increase in the price of electricity between 2000 and Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture. Minister, I know, uh, I know you recently attended the Boating uh, Ontario conference in Niagara Falls, where there were over 300 recreational boating industry leaders and decision makers. In my riding of Perth Wellington, we are blessed with some beautiful waterways, which are perfect for recreational boaters. It's also a popular summer activity in my riding, although I know its impact province-wide is much larger. Minister, can you tell us what kind of impact the recreational boating industry has on Ontario? Mr. Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker. I also want to say thank you to the enthusiastic and good member from Perth Wellington for bringing this to the floor of the Assembly today. You know, Mr. Speaker, as with most things in the Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries, uh, boating also plays an integral role in the spectacular double bottom line of this ministry. In fact, over six million Ontarians enjoy boating 
uh, each and every summer, and that contributes to amazing memories and the cultural fabric of this province. But in addition to that, Speaker, the recreational boating industry accounts for over 30,000 Ontario jobs, contributing to over Four billion dollars in revenues for the province, uh, and, and sorry, revenues total, resulting in an impact of approximately 2.3 billion dollars in revenues for our province to continue to build roads, bridges, and other valuable infrastructure. So, Speaker, I look forward to the supplemental, but I want to assure the minister that we are the member that we're taking this very seriously, and we want to continue to support the Ontario Boating Association. Supplementary question, Mr. Ste uh, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly encouraging to hear how well our recreational boating industry is doing in Ontario and to hear what a great impact they have on the province, both financially and in terms of job creation. In my writing, recreational boaters flock to places like Conestoga Lake. It attracts tourists from, from the region, across the province, and also from out of province. Local businesses that support these boaters are valuable job creators and respected members of their communities who have a measurable local impact. Can the minister tell the legislature what she and her ministry are doing to support this important industry? Minister. Thank you very much to the member. We want to assure that the Ontario Boating Association and those six million Ontarians have smooth sailing on some clear waters across Ontario, Speaker. We want to make sure that they're continue to be supported and they know they have a business-friendly, job-friendly and boating-friendly government here in the province of Ontario. And that's why last week at the Ontario Boating Conference in Niagara Falls, I was able to announce funding of up to $14,000 from the Tourism Development Fund for their 2020 Waterfront Tourism Summit at the Toronto International National Boat Show this coming January. Speaker, this is an important part of our spectacular double bottom line, and this ministry is committed to ensuring that we are open for business, open for jobs, and open for boaters. The next question, the member for Toronto, St. Paul. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. Last week, the government announced the next steps in their review of anti-black racism at the Peel District School Board. Many in our black communities were frustrated to hear that neither of the reviewers are black. Black community members are once again forced to commit to the emotional and intellectual labor of educating non-black viewers on what anti-black racism looks like rather than have the opportunity the minister promised them to disclose their experiences and have solutions presented to them by experts with lived experience, Mr. Speaker. The lived experience, for example, of being disproportionately streamed as black children out of academic classes. Previous reviews, like the review of the roots of youth violence, Dr. Carl James' We Rise Together, and many more, Stephen Lewis's report on race relations, have centered black reviewers. Question. Minister, why did the government fail to appoint a black reviewer to a review that is supposed to look at anti-black racism within the Peel District School Board? Thank you. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It is the government's commitment to ensure that every child in Ontario, particularly in Peel, feels safe, welcomed, and respected. It's why, upon the issues being raised by the community, by members of the Black community in Peel, as well as the uh, chair and vice chair of the board, among others, we took immediate action to call in a review. The two individuals we've called in, uh, Enna Chada, who is an experienced human rights lawyer, an educator, an investigator, a mediator. She actually worked, Mr. Speaker, as vice chair of the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario. We trust her judgment to lead this process, relying on the lived experiences of families and children and educators impacted. Suzanne Herbert, who is a former deputy minister, but as well as someone that worked on the helped lead the review of the York Region District School Board on a similar, although different, issue about anti-black racism in schools. We denounce it. We stand with families and parents, and as well, I'll be leading on one of my associate deputy ministers, Response. Patrick Case, the ADM for Education Equity Secretariat, to lead the way in ensuring that these boards end these practices and every child feels respected in Peel. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, what I've just heard is that the government could not find two qualified black professionals with lived experience to review the Peel District School Board. That is shameful. Mr. Speaker, parents, students and educators have been contacting our offices, concerned that this government is not taking anti-black racism and discrimination in our schools seriously. The exclusion of black reviewers, Minister, from the PDSB review is shocking. 
Mikhail Jean, former Governor General, stated that the lack of a black reviewer is, quote, not only an offence but totally counterproductive, Mr. Speaker. And Dave Doyen says that in the absence of the inclusion of a qualified member from the black community, this review will be not will not enjoy cre credibility, Mr. Speaker. Will the minister correct his decision, please, and appoint a black reviewer? to the Peel District School Board Review as a lived and professional expert on anti-black racism, yes or no? I ask the members to please take their seats. The Minister of Education will reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are absolutely committed to combat these very serious allegations of systemic racism within our schools in Peel Region and in all boards across the province. The allegations are serious. It's why, upon hearing about them directly from parents and students and educators and administrators, we took immediate action to call in reviewers. One of the reviewers is the same reviewer that helped us under the former government, but helped the York Region Board deal with systemic issues of discrimination. My associate deputy minister, the Education Equity Secretary, Patrick Case, is a leader within the black community, is a human rights lawyer, is a person of an impeccable integrity who's committed to work with both reviewers to ensure accountability, to ensure those young people's voices are heard. In fact, I met with members of the Peel Region Board, uh, members rather of both trustees and students just last week with members of the Peel Caucus in our government, to listen firsthand about the allegations. They are disturbing, and it is why, Mr. Speaker, we are acting swiftly to ensure there is transformation Response. change in Peel. Next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and uh, Forestry. And last week, he was in North Bay to announce the redesigned Forestry Sector Investment and Innovation Program. Ontario's forestry sector generates over $16 billion in annual revenues, supports 155,000 direct and indirect jobs, primarily in rural and northern Ontario. Yeah. Speaker, it's easy to see how much passion the minister has for the sector, and I'm confident. With his hard work, the industry will finally be back on the right track. Can the minister inform this House on how this announcement will benefit the sector and the hardworking men and women who are employed by it right across the province of Ontario? Yeah. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the great member from Haldeman Norfolk yes. for that question. Speaker, as you know, Ontario wood pro products are globally recognized as coming from forests that are responsibly and sustainably managed. We have a plan to create the right conditions to help the forest industry you know, innovate, attract investment, and create jobs for communities all across the province. The Forest Sector Investment and Innovation Program will emphasize the impact a project can have on a region and Ontario's forest sector as a whole, while considering key outcomes such as jobs, innovation, productivity, or product enhancements. This program helps address the economic development challenges of doing business in the province's rural and northern regions and is part of our government's plan for building Ontario together. And I'll have more to say in the here, here. The supplementary question. Well, thank you to the, uh, the minister for that answer, Speaker, and I'm heartened to see that our government recognizes the benefits of having a strong forestry industry in Ontario, and I'm glad to see how committed the minister is to creating an environment that will help the forestry sector succeed within the province of Ontario. By growing our forestry sector, we can help communities across the province thrive, building a future with a better quality of life and a higher standard of living. Through you, Speaker, would the minister please explain how this redesign program will make it easier for those who work in the forest industry to do business in Ontario. Sure. Minister. Thank you, Speaker, again. To, thank you for the member for that question. I was pleased to be with the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade last week to make that announcement. Along with its new name, FSIP will make it easier for forestry businesses to gain access and apply for funding. The new program is focused on streamlining the process and will put greater emphasis on the impact a project will have on its given region. I'm looking forward soon to launching a draft forest sector strategy that will help industry innovate, attract new investment, protect and create jobs, securing a future for the communities and families who depend on the industry. These initiatives will offer better support for the industry, help us promote a stronger and more dynamic forest sector, and enable us to make Ontario 
the most attractive place in North America, North America to invest, grow business, and create jobs. We're open for jobs. We're open for business. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Transportation. Last week, the, the government finally disclosed performance records to Ontario's private highway maintenance contractors. It shows that last year, the government issued over $291,000 in penalties against highway maintenance contractors who violated their agreements. Why? Due to not taking care of the highways, not proper sanding, not meeting certain time limits. Why does this minister think that the people in Sault Ste. Marie, where the service provider was violated the most, who services not only Sault Ste. Marie, but the entire region of Algoma Manitoulin, why does she think that the performance company are there to keep are not there to keep our roads safe? The Minister of Transportation. Well, Mr. Speaker, um, as the member knows, I it is the position of this minister and this, the Ministry of Transportation that, uh, that the goal is to keep our roads safe and to pave our highways as quickly as possible so that motorists can travel along our roads safely and quickly, Mr. Speaker. And we take, uh, we take this responsibility very seriously, and our private contractors that work uh, for the Ministry of Transportation are doing a good job, Mr. Speaker, of clearing our roads and getting to bare pavement as quickly as possible and doing so beating standards uh, at, at the top class highway across the province. Mr. Speaker, we are doing everything that we can to find ways to enhance our service levels in the north and across the province, and we will continue to do so. The supplementary question. Minister, I was on those highways last night, and I have to tell you, they, you missed the goal. Uh, the, the standards were not even met. I would invite you at one point or another to come to Northern Ontario and visit our roads. Earlier this winter, or just a couple of weeks, my colleague introduced a private member's bill that would end second-class treatments of Highway 17 and 11 and to ensure that they're plowed as quickly as possible at the same level as the 400 series. Instead, the government showed that they are perfectly happy to let Northern Ontarians roll the dice and get on the winter roads. Now we have learned that highway maintenance contractors are violating service agreements to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why does the minister think Algoma and Sioux families deserve a private snow plow contractor with the worst compliance record in Ontario? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the member knows, we take the safety of our roads and clearance very seriously, and we are working closely with our contractors to ensure that they are meeting the service levels that we expect in the south and in the north. And as uh, our winter conditions will continue to worsen over the next coming months, it's something that we are going to be monitoring closely. But if the member opposite wants to talk about people in this House voting against things, they're going to support the people of Northern Ontario. I'd like to ask him and the members of the opposition why they decided to vote against the four-laning of Order. sections of Highway 69 and Highway 11 and 17 in the north, including stretches between Kenora and the Manitoba border. Mr. Speaker, why are they voting against measures Order. to make life more affordable for people in the, New York, in, in the North by voting against the fall economic statement, which will see a reduction in the aviation fuel tax rate in Northern Ontario. Mr. Speaker, that will go a Response. long way to making the cost of groceries go down in the, in the North, Mr. Speaker, and making life more affordable. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is for the Minister of Transportation. Speaker, we've heard a, a lot of great news uh, about getting subways built for the City of Toronto in recent months, but I understand the Minister is focused on improving transportation options across the province, not only here in the GTA. Rural municipalities need our help to get their communities moving, and I know the Community Transportation Grant Program is a means to that end. Could the Minister uh, please tell us about this important program? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for the question. We campaign on making life more affordable for Ontarians and making life easier for Ontarians. That's why the Community Transportation Program is so important. The Community Transportation Grant Program will provide up to $30 million over five years 
to assist municipalities to support local and intercommunity transportation projects well. in areas that are currently underserved or, Mr. Speaker, unserved. The municipalities will use this provincial funding to partner with community organizations to coordinate local transportation services for their communities. This is just another example of our government working together with our municipal partners to ensure that they have what they need to best serve their communities. Mr. Speaker, our government is committing, committed to getting Ontario moving because we recognize just how, it is important, how important it is that every Ontarian have access to reliable transit. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. It's indisputable that access to reliable transit uh, has the ability to improve the quality of life uh, for every Ontarian. Going to work, attending appointments, and visiting families and friends all become significantly more challenging when the transportation options are poor. And I can tell the minister from my riding at Perth Wellington, these projects are working very well, and thank you so much for paying attention to rural Ontario. So can the minister tell us more about how the Community Transportation Grant program works? Minister. And I'd like to thank the member for all his advocacy work on behalf of the residents of his riding. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the Community Transportation Grant Program support, provides support to municipalities to serve more riders, to provide more trips, and to reach more destinations. There are a variety of projects that are being funded through this program. Owen Sound received more than $1.2 million in funding for a project to reinstate a fixed route from Owen Sound to the Guelph Central GO Station. Wow. Mr. Speaker, Perth County received funding of over $1.4 million for the creation of a Perth County transit system, which operates from Mondays to Fridays. Mr. Speaker, the City of Stratford received funding of over $1.4 million as well to support inter-regional bus access from Strat Stratford, St. Mary's, Listowel to intermodal hubs in Kitchener and London. Mr. Speaker, these are only just a few examples of the great projects that are being supported by the Community Transportation Grant Program. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.